So today we'll be doing a transradial um, uterine fibroid embolization. Next slide. Can we, yeah, can we show the slides? I don't think they're coming up on the, there we go, thanks. Um, so this is a, a young woman, premenopausal, she's 44 years old, um, gravita 2, para 2, with a, a past medical history of lupus. Um, this has been complicated by DVT and PE, for which she's currently on anticoagulation. She takes her also daily. Um, she's had a known history of uterine fibroids, um, for which she's been symptomatic. Um, she has heavy menstrual bleeding and intermenstrual bleeding. She also has um, bulk-related symptoms, such as um, bloating, urinary frequency, back pain, constipation. Um, she's even had episodes of syncope related to blood loss anemia. Um, she's not interested in pursuing surgical options and desires a minimally invasive approach. Um, so just her medications again, iron and Xeralto. Um, physical exam, um, she is um, uh, normal vitals, um, standard physical exam. Her abdomen is soft, non-tender with a, um, a greater than 25 week uterus. Next slide. Um, these are selected um, sequences of her recent MRI. Um, on the left is an axial post-contrast sequence, and on the right is a sagittal T2, um, both of which are showing bulky fibroids uh, with a very large uterus. Um, her fibroids are hypervascular, which is favorable for this procedure. Next slide. <clears throat> so um, overall, this is a 44-year-old woman with symptomatic uterine fibroids on long-term anticoagulation in the setting of an underlying prothrombotic condition who desires minimally invasive management of her um, bleeding symptoms. And so today we'll proceed with um, a uterine artery embolization. Thanks. Uh, so I'm going to go show you what we've done so far. So we did a, a left uh, radial access here. She was a Barbo B, it's something that we check um, every time before we uh, prep the patient. Um, we used a Merit Prelude 4 French sheath, and then um, we used a, um, a, uh, a Cordis uh, VER catheter for French. It's a 038, and it's 125 centimeters in length. Uh, the front end looks like a ruck, so uh, kind of like that. So here you can see the wire going up the radial. Um, and here you can see us coming around and down the arch. Actually, we didn't have to use any special catheter. The wire just kind of kind of went down the arch, which actually that part didn't, well, I guess it kind of saved. But um, yeah, it just kind of went down the arch uh, without too much work, actually really no work. It just kind of went down. Um, and so we just tracked this all down over a, uh, over a Benson. Um, you can see here's the, the vert coming down the abdominal aorta. The wire actually just went directly into the, into the, um, hypogastric artery. I don't know why it's doing this. Into the hypogastric artery. So we just sort of follow that. It went to the left. So we kind of let it go wherever it goes. Um, here's our, our first run. We did a ipsilateral oblique. Um, we don't always do all these runs, but just because we're trying to show it, we, we sort of did some runs at sort of lowest frame rate here. Um, and so you can see a big uterine artery uh, coming off the, the hypogastric there, um, off the anterior division. Um, we actually just sort of puffed our, our way in. Here you can see we first were in a vaginal branch sort of turned the catheter a little bit, puffed, and then sort of moved forward, and you can see kind of where we, where we are. Um, I have to say, we're going to go ahead, just for the sake of time, go ahead and start to embolize. So we're using, starting with 500 to 700 uh, embospheres here. Um, so Sarah's going to go ahead and inject um, here slowly, although she can actually go pretty quick here. So. For the moderators who are uh, doing mostly radial for their UFEs, have you had instances where you're having spasm um, from the wrist or arm to a point where you're not able to potentially treat both sides? Do you see that rarely, if at all? I mean, I've definitely had spasm in the radial artery during a treatment. Usually you can force enough nitro around the base catheter to get them to relax. I have had to stop before and just wait for like 20 minutes with no manipulation. That also helps with relaxation, but I've never had it limit me from completing a treatment. Yeah, I have to say also, I was referring, you know, sorry, I was referring to spasm in the uterine artery, not spasm yeah. in the wrist. Yeah, I just kind of okay. thinking about Okay, yeah, just making sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, again, we, we tend to sedate our UFE patients a little bit heavier uh, just to help, especially because, you know, they're young young women, just to make sure that uh, they, their, their radial artery doesn't go into spasm. Sedation a lot of times will help with, with that. Um, also, you know, we, we, I didn't talk about, we sort of moved up in size, we put some 500 to 700s, it was just sort of chugging along, so we kind of moved up in size, so we're, we did some 700s, and now we're actually up to 900s. Um, the other thing that we do uh, in terms of our pre-op for our UFEs, um, 
one of the things that we've seemed to have helped a lot in terms of pain control afterwards is uh, IV Tylenol. Um, we've been using that a, a fair bit for the last few years. Um, I don't know. And the other thing is also we send, uh, we actually do this as an outpatient. So all these patients are, are going home um, afterwards. Have you ever used the ulnar for a, a UV? So, um, so in terms of actual measurements, I haven't uh, been using an actual measurement. Uh, it's more so if I can put a sheath in it, it's probably big enough. Um, the we've had ones where it just looks too small, where I, I don't think I'm going to be able to hit it with uh, with the needle. Um, and so then those patients, I've sort of moved. Um, I, I, we have done ulnar once or twice. It's not my preference, um, but uh, we have we have done it. I don't, yeah, and, and for those people who aren't doing radial access, you know, we do give a radial cocktail uh, at, once we get access. It's ours is 3,000 heparin, two and a half of verapamil, and 200 mics of uh, nitroglycerin right through the radial artery sheath once we have access. Um, the other thing we do um, for our, our, all our radial accesses is uh, we actually put nitro paste and emla cream on the access point. Um, in the pre-op area, so it's on for about 45 minutes before they, they get into the room. Um, and so that sort of helps prevent spasm and also helps with a little bit of the pain control as well. Perfect. So again, we're just sort of moving along here in sizes and stuff. And now we're up to like the, what are the 1300s, the, the ping pong balls here. Um, um, Rahul, do you ever use uh, intra-arterial lidocaine? We will. In the uterine so, uh, artery? Um, we, we sort of use uh, uh, Maureen's, uh, uh, follow Maureen's uh, paper. So we, uh, so it's a group out of UCSF. What we will do is um, we will, after we get to the end point of our embolization, and then we'll give the intra-arterial uh, lidocaine. Um, and there's a, there's a good paper from, uh, from UCSF showing that the, the clinical results are about the same, whether you do it intra, I guess, sort of in between your embolization or um, or after. So the clinical results are about the same, but the level of infarction from uh, on MRI is much better with uh, giving it afterwards because the lidocaine obviously causes a lot of spasm. Hey Rahul, does, uh, do you guys typically step up with the same product and size the way that you're doing now, or does anyone on the panel use another product like PVA when they see a, an extremely large uterus like this or start straight with Embosphere? Yeah, so we use, uh, so once we get to a certain size, so we used Embospheres up until we got to about the, the 900s, and then we had to switch because uh, we don't have anything really bigger in the Embospheres. So we actually use the Embozine, the big, the pink ping pong ball Embozines. Um, the problem, I, I would love to use PVA, we just don't carry it, so that's sort of the problem. But uh, we, we, I have done that in the past. Uh, so we're, obviously, we, you saw that sort of uh, puff angiogram there. Um, still needs more. We still haven't quite reached our endpoint yet, uh, so we're going to keep uh, keep pumping in beads um, here until we get to a, a good endpoint. Um, you know, again, we we sort of use it until basically we stop seeing the the enhancement of the fibroids as opposed to shutting down uh, the uterine artery or the, the three or four bead stasis. We tend to let it go a little bit less less uh, sort of earlier em embolic endpoint than that. So I don't. What what do you guys use as your your endpoint for for embolization for these? Always a tricky conversation. I use anti-grade flow in the main uterine artery without fibroid branches enhancing. So, um, you know, sort of the five cardiac beat thing. And I, I think it's important. I, the one thing I noticed is when I, in fellowship I where I trained, we treated to a little bit more of a static point. Women just had such incredible pain um, when you're getting the normal myometrium and it's unnecessary anyway. Uh, so I've really adapted to a little bit of a near stasis approach and it doesn't seem to, I mean, this is just anecdotal, but it doesn't seem to affect the overall infarction. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I, I think when we were going, when, again, where I trained and uh, Janice was there too, so, uh, but uh, we tended to go to almost to almost stasis and uh, they had a significant amount of pain and with, with doing it this way, I find they have a significantly less amount of pain. Um, and they still get a good clinical endpoint. So Raul, I have a question. So this lady is 44 years old. Maybe this is controversial, but um, did you get an endometrial biopsy beforehand? I know you uh, were having. She she saw two gynecologists, so I let them decide whether she needed it beforehand or or not. So. Um, I can't remember whether she specifically got one. We tend to, if they don't have a gynecologist, we will send them to see a gynecologist and sort of let them decide about the, the endometrial biopsy. But we, for women who are older, peri perimenopausal, we will typically ask that they get an endometrial biopsy. Perfect, thanks. And so we're, I think we're basically done with this side and then we're gonna switch over to the other side and just push more beads. So uh, thank you everyone.
great discussion.